Game number one, everybody. Kurzo against Rising Gaming. And we have Division 1 today. So I'm not quite sure what you expect here, honestly. I gotta admit that before we went into the match, I had a bit of a sneak peek at builds that are being played in terms of team composition. And this one is definitely an interesting one. More so starting with the next map. Uh, but yeah, I really want to see how this is going to pan out, but let's introduce the players first. We have Lejo Namieli on Jaina, Riku on Hanzu, Porky on Anduin. I would puke too if I had to play Anduin. Patsko on Zaratul and Maspe on Johanna. On the right side of the map we are seeing Kragoral on Kelthas for Rising Gaming, Blank on Urel, Dakba. Uh, distant cousin of Admiral Akbar on Malfurion, Kastarat on Garrosh, and uh, Kelly on Reyna. And yeah, I'm a little bit curious to see how that's going to pan out here because, again, this is Division 1, and usually in Division 1 you have Master, Grandmaster level, when we're talking Storm League, but you definitely have players that have quite a bit of synergy. But we already have a Kalthas in there, and that's something that you don't really see all that often. I went actually into a long spiel about this in one of the recent. Division S games, Kalthas is normally a hero that you get to see on smaller maps like Infernal Shrines and Tomb of the Spider Queen occasionally. And he is becoming a little bit more frequent. But generally speaking, it's not really one of your priority majors. We still have Li Ming, we still have Jaina and a couple of others there. They usually steal the show. But let's see how it pans out here. Obviously on level 1, as so often, we're getting the Mana Addict. That doesn't really come as a shocker. And when we're talking about builds, I gotta say that we have a really nice Wombo on the side of the blue team, on the side of Kurzo, our Division 1 team with a bold strategy on Anduin, because we have that set up with Zaratul and with Jaina, so a good Void Prison straight into a Ring of Frost uh, that hopefully doesn't fail. A little bit of an adjustment on Urel already with the Light of Karabor. It's actually a build that we've now seen a couple of times with level 1 and level 7 changes on uh, Urel and has been played quite a bit right now. But it's not really the go-to build for her. And I mean, we are on Alderac Pass, a map that we see a bit more often these days, but not that much. Ooh, Reyna actually falling here. And he's not falling in the middle, he's falling at the bot lane actually in the 1 versus 1. Now, that shouldn't have happened. That's an interesting uh, turn of events here. That's definitely not something that you see all that much, that Reyna gets taken out in the solo lane by a Hanzo, only one and a half minutes in. So it's a bit of a weird start here for Rising. And Rising Gaming was actually always one of the better teams in Division 1, so they have to be careful here. It's actually, both of them are neck-to-neck -neck in the standings when uh, this match happened, so they are roughly in the middle of the pack here. And it is obviously a pretty big division. And as the question starts popping up recently quite a lot, especially when we're casting Division 7, I want to quickly throw out here that anybody can play in Heroes Launch. It doesn't matter if you're Wood League, if you're Plastic League, if you're Gold, Master or whatnot. It doesn't matter if you have a five-man team, if you're a solo player. You can participate in Heroes Launch. All that you have to do is you go to heroeslaunch.gg. The link is usually actually also in the video on those uh, matches. And you just check it out right there. They have a massive S FAQ where you can actually read up on most of the frequently asked questions. I mean, duh. And they kind of answer everything there. And if they don't, they have a Discord server which you can either join over the app or through the web. And you can just ask any question that you might have. But I can only recommend it. It's a match a week and it's a totally different experience from playing Heroes of the Storm in Storm League or any other setup, quick match, you, what, what you have it. So I would highly recommend that. Get yourself a team there. All the teams, for example, that we sometimes commentate that have an FAT in front of the team name. So let's say, for example, Fat Hulk. It's not just because Hulk is fat and needs to go on a diet or the players on the team are all overweight. It's not quite that. Nope, it's actually free agent teams, which means that it's individual players that joined up and then because of their rank got mixed into a team and they play together. So definitely make sure that you check that out if you're interested in playing there. As we're seeing this, that down at the bottom, we still have that little poke set up, and in this case, it's actually even Johanna starting to move in. The level 7 talents are ready for both of the teams. We've seen some aggression now also around, well, first of all, mercenary camps. Bit of an early commitment here, also for the first objective. And with the level 7, we have now the binding heal as well on Anduin. Uh, this time, Reyna sitting in a good spot to put the extra damage on the Johanna at the front. 
putting that to some good use immediately as the team shields that works out quite nicely and they're actually putting the pressure on once again the jump back Patsko on the other hand and Zeratul is already half HP as Jimmy goes in for the order attacks one after another nearly gets the kill against Johanna here we're seeing Urel jumping in straight into a cone of cold and that definitely hurt as we have Jaina delivering quite a bit of pain Level 7 talent for Kalthas, as usual, the Burned Flesh. Pretty much going for the main build so far, what we're seeing here. Jimmy on level 1 has also headed into his extra damage based on the roots and slows. And things are currently working out quite nicely for the red team. They might be a little bit behind, but they are definitely the ones uh, pressuring right now. There's no Wombo combo available yet for Okurzo. And here comes another delivery as Kazdorak with Garrosh throws in Johanna a little bit. But they gotta be careful here. The damage again, mainly coming from Jimmy at this point in time. But Kalthas obviously trying to spread the love here a little bit and making sure that the opponent is taken out by that. And here's the capture. They actually get the channel through. Blue team looking good. Kurzo starting to move in here. Again the lockdown. Johanna moving in deep, gets thrown out. Cambry taken by the grunts and they're starting to look for the kill against Urel but at the same time we're having the continuous poke from Kalthas himself with a burned flesh here and on top of that also Jimmy taking aim whenever someone enters the auto attack range so they're still pushing through the lanes here we're seeing a similar strategy also at the mid lane where we have Zeratul rotate over and use his cleave to burn that through keep in mind that in the current patch the cleave build has been nerfed slightly it's still a very very powerful and effective build and is chosen for exactly that reason but it definitely has lost a little bit of a zing and therefore the teams have now a bit of he's not quite as dangerous anymore as he was before but void slash and the other talents still are taken it's still the build that most players follow and for very good reason obviously talking about builds johanna in this case is not capitalizing on the new hold your ground cooldown reduction instead we're seeing the laws of hope which is from a sustainability perspective definitely still the better talent to take down here johanna's moving in johanna is a little bit deep if you ask me there's nobody else to help out and that should be a kill to be honest but anduin comes in gets the quick throw back but the problem is that anduin himself now immediately thrown in a bit deeper by garage it's the kill against urel that falls first though nicely done by the blue team they get the next kill and they get the level 10 and now the light bomb oh the arrow set up totally not working out oh that was a huge problem and now they have two down a garage falls and that's a two for two trade but damn son <laughs> it's not what you want to happen if you have a level 10 advantage what the fuck's happening rising gaming is ripping them a new one here they didn't even have level 10 for that fight and that entire setup just backfired so hard apparently Jaina wasn't able to close the distance to the void prison after it was dropped to get the ring of frost in so they relied on hanzo to get the arrow and that's also a true and tried combo but it's a little bit more difficult to execute when you get the arrow in and you're trying to release the void prison just as the arrow hits so that the stun is delivered but in this case the arrow went through void prison didn't get opened up enough Zeratul was also under pressure here as you could obviously see but still they get three kills against the team that has heroic abilities over them that was quite brutal and now they're going for Jaina again Jaina gets attacked there's a taunt after the throw and Anduin is down the crybaby is dead and so is Jaina both blondies are therefore dropped and they're trying to make the play for Patsku as the Hyperion is already zoning the team out, Zeratul jumping out, using the wormhole here. Nice attempt onto Johanna as she moves in with a condemned to try and save the assassin. And she actually manages to do that without falling. Nicely played here. But 1.6 seconds were still missing from the objective for Kurzo. But instead, it seems more and more as if Rising Gaming is going to get the first one here. And indeed, they do nicely played. For now, Riku down at the bottom again against Reyna. But we have nearly, we have quest completed too. Look at Kalthas, just 19. Nearly delivering, and there it is. Quest completion on the Mana Addict. 16,000 damage by him, even ahead of Jimmy at this point. And with five girls against three. Actually looking strong here. Zero deaths so far on Johanna. But I gotta admit, that was really well done by Rising Gaming. I didn't give them a like, oh, I'd say I wouldn't have bet a dollar on them, considering that they fell behind with the level 10. Once that happened, it just seemed obvious that Kurzo would be able to get the objective, which I guess was exactly the mindset they were on too. So that wouldn't help as well. 
Once again, we're seeing them just move through the bot lane here and trying to get some pressure through the objective. Mid lane has already been defended, but up towards the top, it's a bit of a different story as Urel goes up against Zeratul. Jaina needs to be a little bit careful. Definitely had a couple of weird moments there. Nice! Ring of Frost actually connecting, and that might be a kill against Reyna, but he gets healed, and the fight of flight procs, and Jaina now gets maybe even punished for being out a little bit too much. Yeah, Kazerat on Garrosh really wants Jaina, but there is a reason that Jaina is oftentimes chosen against Garrosh. Not only does she really pack a punch, but at the same time she can also control his movements quite nicely with the slows that oh, it's obviously added to everything. Uh, an adjustment on level 13 for Kalthas, so I'm not quite sure if I like it. Backdraft... I mean, again, it is understandable sometimes why you want to go into backdraft and why you feel like you get additional value out of it, but I'm not really a fan. I really believe that the Pyromaniac with the cooldown reduction is a huge priority, and it is the talent that gets mostly played also in Division S. Now, obviously, outside of the fact that you have Johanna, Zeratul, and a couple of other heroes that backdraft might be useful against, I think one of the main reasons that we are seeing Kelthar backing into it is that he wants to provide some additional synergy with Jimmy's ace in the hole on level 1. Personally, I honestly don't believe that it's worth it giving up the cooldown reduction since the CDR is just a massively impactful tool for Kalthas to work with. But you can see the thought process and what he's trying to do. Yeah, I don't really believe that it's worth the switch but the thought is pretty clear considering what we're having on the table for them here. It offers definitely a few tools. Boss nearly taken, well uh, at least they attempted it, but it was immediately shut down by the rotation. But it's 13 versus 13 talents now as they're starting to make the move down to the bottom. In the meantime we also have now the Holy Fury taken here. And once again, having the move in, the arrow, big boy arrow, and the VP screws up the Ring of Frost. Oh, Kazdarad goes down regardless, though, in a bit of counter damage as they try to go for a second kill. But well, that was a bit of a weird one. It's honestly a bit hard to tell who screwed this one up. If it was really the fault of Patsko and Zeratul that he went in with the Void Prison, or more so Jaina being a bit too trigger happy on the Ring of Frost and not having the patience to wait for Zeratul to make the engage. Normally, what you want to do is wait for Zeratul to set everything up. But yeah, the synergy was definitely not th there, there. So it's a little bit too easy to say like Saratul screwed it up, but the delay between the two heroics being used was so short that you can't really... I mean, he had very, very little time to really react to that. And usually it's Jaina who's supposed to wait until the Void Prison gets dropped so that he can then go in and uh, prepare the VP. But yeah, either way... They got a kill, they got only one though, and now the fight is starting up again as we're looking at the objective, and it's again the blue team that is really starting to be aggressive here. But you can tell how Jaina just keeps finding herself in these weird positions at the front, and that is starting to become a problem. Urel has already taken her measure, and is jumping straight onto her whenever she can. Uh, Jaina's died twice so far in this game. 22,000 to 25,000 and uh, 24,000 damage now for the damage dealers on Ryzen Gaming. On the other side, we're having Hanzo with 31k. Not looking too bad here either. That poke damage obviously starting to come into play for him. And talking about things that are starting to uh, take a little bit of an impact here. Level 16 is nearly ready for them. And that is going to be a pretty great talent. 16, generally speaking, is always, of course, a big, big power spike, but especially for Kelthas here. I want to see what we're going to get with that, if we're heading into Ignite or if it's the Fury of the Sun will instead. With a level 7 talent, uh, Fury of the Sun, uh, well, both, I guess, would make sense here. Depends a little bit on which way you want to go with your build, but we have Fury of the Sun well taken. The synergy, therefore, with the Burn Flash. And they're starting to take the objective now, 16 versus 16 with the Cone of Cold now getting the Numbing Blast advantage. Also, Cleave comes in with a Void Slash, so that's obviously going to help out for Zeratul. Again, the build got slightly nerfed by Blizzard in the recent patch, but it's still a powerful one. And let's see, what do we have for Anduin? Even-handed Blessings. First time that we actually see that in a game here. Um, okay. Bit of a cooler reduction that he works around. Usually it's uh, not quite the focus that we're having on the hero. But Anduin has had a couple of decent moments here. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, oh yeah. Random ring and Johanna comes in to capitalize on that big boy arrow though. And the kill against Jaina 
Kel'Thas gets the drop in and they kill Anduin too. Here comes the Hyperion again and with the quick hooves on the foot, on the face, they get actually Hansa as well. Doesn't really matter if you get the hooves on the foot or on the face, both really hurts. And in that case, ah, well, Hansa didn't have a lot of hit points. And I gotta admit, Jaina just needs a bit more patience. I really think that Jaina is a little bit too trigger happy right now and moves out of position quite often to try and get those quick kills in. And it feels to me like uh, she wants to just get that moment where she destroys an opponent with all the burst that she has. Which is definitely possible, but you have two heroes to set these kills up for you and she kinda has to play a little bit more patient to work with them and allow them to really get that set up for her. Right now it feels a bit too forced and all they have to do is pretty much... Like all the red team has seems to have to do right now is give Jaina a little bit of space and room to hang herself and put herself into a combo or into a position where she just feels pressured. It's just a little bit, not enough patience is basically what it comes down to. That's what it feels like right now. Be that as it may, we're still having that big push coming now thanks to the objective and the obvious boss that got taken at the top side. And with one level ahead, it currently looks good for Ryzen Gaming. They're starting to push through with this. At the bottom of the map, the defense is already there. And they're starting to get the big lead. They want to have the keep, obviously, and they're already going straight for it. But that game isn't quite over yet. It could be the fence, should be the defense. Here comes the ring, and this time it connects with three, actually. They might get the kills here, and they go for the double. They get Jimmy first. They're trying to get the bar. VP comes actually through. Can they follow that up with anything? That doesn't look like it. Only Patsku is there, but they get the kill against Garrosh, who zoned them out in the meantime. Once more, we have the follow-up, though. And they're trying to make the play for the two survivors here. So far, nobody mounting up. Blank is jumping away. Have no doubt that Ural is escaping. Question is what happens around uh, Malfurion. And yep, he goes down. Now, here's obviously the problem. Yes, a lot of damage against the, uh, against the boss here. Against the core. The problem is that doesn't help you on the map because it recovers so swiftly. There's a bit of pressure in the middle. But now there's a momentum all of a sudden for the blue team. And they're already about to use that. They're moving straight into the middle. And they're trying to take maybe also one of the keeps down. Or at least steal the camp away. So one of the two is what they're going to try and get here. This is also a little bit of a setup where I gotta say. We have still a few more things that the blue team can pull off here. Especially if they set anything up for Jaina, she can still deliver the damage as we just saw. All you need is a combo or two that work out and all of a sudden the game turns, which is exactly what we just witnessed. Seven kills against eight now. And I mean, this isn't over by any means, but this was also... It's still a bit of a problem here for the blue team. Let's not try to sweeten that too much because, as you can tell, they are starting to fall behind, or they have fallen behind the structures quite significantly. And in the long run, that is going to be, or could be, a deciding factor in this particular setup. Either way, camps are now taken. Objective is popping up again, and both of the teams are eager to get their level 20. The blue team is a little bit more timid and goes for the small camp, whereas the boss is getting attacked by their opponent. But Hanzo is already sniffing that out, and I think just in time, they are invading this. And that could be a problem. I mean, seriously, you look at experience, and level 20 is also so close. Let's see if they let it leash. Yeah, there's the big boy arrow. Zara 2 could get the boy in prison. The ring comes through though. And the red team might just have screwed themselves here. Johanna is currently zoning. She dies and the boss is taken. So at least they take the boss mid lane under heavy pressure thanks to the camp that was already taken earlier. So the keeps will be in trouble. And they might even get the kill against Dakpa. No, he gets away. Malfurion still lives, and now obviously the question, do you go for the objective? Do you try and push with the boss here? Do you accept? Oh my god, they get the kill against you. Oh, they get the kill against both. Urel and Malfurion both die. It's a four versus five situation, but they get both. They get the fort at the bottom. The keep in the middle is in trouble too. They can go for the objective now if they want. The blue team with massive, massive momentum right now. Looking great here. Zeratul delivering. That keep is down, already destroyed. The boss at the bottom is going to put some pressure onto the next one. And the red team, they just wanted too much. They played it too greedy. This obviously is a bit of a problem. Someone has to deal with it. They can't just simply let that slide 18 minutes in. And yep, they have already won back. Okay, so that at least is going to help here. So they're going to get that for now. But the objective is being fought over now. The red team was so far ahead and then they were just too greedy and they tried to went for the boss and it didn't really work. Johanna sacrificed herself and zoned everybody else out from uh, the boss spot. 
Now there's the recover, but obviously it's a bit of a problem. Zeratul is sniffing everything out here. Top lane has been uh, defended, so they're starting to uh, make the play over to the right once again. Zeratul actually goes down. Oh, that is a problem. Zeratul goes down, gets caught as he is just moving around there and gets eliminated and that couldn't come at a worse time. 50 seconds on him, didn't even use the Void Prison. Kalthas takes him down here and now all of a sudden they're... Oh, the ring! They can't fight this. It's a 5 versus 4. Rigo isn't even here. He went for the camp in the meantime. That's the save against Johanna. But damn, son, they really tried for a second. I, it's easier to defend against the objective than lose another hero here and get staggered deaths. I mean, if they have a chance to recapture that for a few seconds and get Zaratul back into the game, that would be quite something. But right now it feels that they accept that they are going to lose another one. So, uh, it's going to be a little bit weird. I mean, we have the play of the game. We have now the cold snap to flamethrower, obviously, for Kalthas. And they're starting to poke heavily here, trying to do what they can. And it seems like they're actually willing to poke this out a little bit. They're already moving in. They're getting the vision. Johanna's sitting at the side. Is starting to make the play. Kalthas is a little bit low. Can they get the kill here? They're trying to. They're trying to get the hits. Urel is jumping onto Jaina. And Jaina is in trouble. And Jaina is dead. The stagger death right there. Jaina already down. In comes the play against Anduin. Urel herself is low. And Zaratul is coming back now. The objective, by the way, now won by the red team. And Jojo about to fall. That's the three-man VP. And they kill against Kalthas. They're actually winning this. They're actually starting to get kills. Look at Urel. Urel is about to get dropped. Gets the ult in. Riku. Oh, with a kill against Malfurion. Urel is dead too. What the hell is happening here? The blue team is honestly taking kill after kill here. They drop Reyna now. And that's four heroes down the entire time. They were at a disadvantage. And they're going to get the kill against Garrosh eventually as well. Unbelievable. All of a sudden, they are just popping off here. Zaratul amongst them is just wrecking them. And Riku and Hans are also with an insane damage output here, as you can tell. And that's the end of Garrosh. Five-man wipe right there. Total annihilation of the team. And now they can start to go and straight defend against those raiders. But the game is still on. Game is still on. Up here to the top, the boss is already trying to clear that out. Zaratul isn't even dealing with it. He's moving to the bot lane to defend the next keep. But this game is all over the place all of a sudden. Massive fights. I mean, there's a lot of chaos in these fights now as well. Coordination has gone a little bit out the window, if you ask me. But they are definitely starting to absolutely bring the pain here. And I'm talking about the blue team. They are starting to really, really get the damage in. Zeratul in particular has started to just take names and kick ass. And the same goes also for Rico on his Hanzo. He's been eliminating players all over the map. I mean, every single time he sees an opportunity, he goes straight for that kill. And actually, they're sneaking in outside of the minion vision at this point. Uh, or are they? Well, Zaratul goes straight through it. I'm trying to go for the boss. If anybody paid attention to the top lane, they've at least seen Zaratul, but I don't really think so. They're making that rotation up to the top slowly, but that boss could still be taken. And no, they're actually not making that move. Hanzo was still on lane, they saw him, and in the meantime, they moved bot side. I mean, guys, where do you think they are? They're hiding here, boss is taken. Now, granted, there's still a fort up top side, so that's definitely going to slow the progress down. But yeah, we have level 22 on the board now. 14 kills against 12. Bot lane gets pressured. They're already starting to rotate down and attempt, of course, to take that apart. Might even be able to pull that off. Yep, there come the hits. In comes Urel. Boss bot top lane is going to get some value. Question is, can Zaratul maybe flank this with a good VP? Johanna is already there. Aims straight for Malfurion. Realizes that she's alone <laughs> and moves away again. Bit of an early pop on the iron skin as well there. But they're zoning them out for the keep. So that's already a bit of a win. The boss at the top lane is obviously starting to really, really bring the pain right now. But keep in mind that the top keep has already been destroyed on the blue side, so there's continuous gnolls just mo mo moving through the lane. And it comes down to the objective again at the end of the day. But taking at least one of the forts down on the top lane, one of the main structures really helps to elevate some of the pressure, and they're rotating down to another boss. I like the blue team in that late game a lot more than what we're seeing from Rising. Rising had a fantastic mid game and a good early game, but now they're starting to run across the map like headless chickens sometimes. They really seem to struggle a bit to coordinate their efforts here and decide on what they want to do with this. 
they are still in a decent position. I mean, you look at the structures and you can really tell a lot of them are already low. They're going for the objective too, but now they have a camp pushing in the middle and we're talking 24 minutes and they have a boss at the bot lane. So that core is threatened. It's definitely threatened. I mean, that is becoming a problem. They need to deal with that camp. They need to deal with the boss somehow. And that's all time that they're currently missing out on. So things are starting to become quite tricky for them. They are more in a defensive position than anything else. And that obviously allows now the blue team to try and make a play for the objective, which is exactly what they're doing. They're having again the move straight into the middle. Yep, that one is already taking damage. Bot lane is already getting attacked there too. They need to deal with the boss. Keep is likely to fall here. They even, I mean, they are pushing everything against that beast now. But the objective might be lost out on. Yep, there comes another hit. Might just be able to save that, to be honest. Just be able to save this. Yep, but it's a close call. It's a very close call, but they're managing. And Zaratul could sneak in later. Problem is that the objective is now starting to really end up in the hands of Kurzo. That is pretty powerful this late in the game. Yep, Kel'Thas is already in trouble. Holy cow, like he got nearly dropped there by Riku, who goes in again. Zaratul gets saved. There's the ring, and it connects with three. They get the kill against Malfury, and Jaina gets wrecked a second later. The problem is that we're also seeing Garrosh die here. Johanna has also fallen, two for two trade. Anduin is on the run. There's a light bump on himself. Pretty much trying to say, please don't follow me. And yeah, so there are two will drop the Void Prism just to make sure that they couldn't be followed here. But we still have a healer for them, and that's the big advantage now. You still have your healer in play. Hans, on the other hand, low, jumps out, gets saved, and he wants to kill against Urel, and he gets it. But Hanzo falls too, and it's again the Zara Tool show. Patsku the entire time is doing uh, work over and over again, and he says, Kelthas, I got this. Especially with the healer, obviously, behind him. They're starting to make the play actually for the core here. They're going for it, guys. They have the objective, so why wouldn't they? They have actually won it. The prison camp has been taken by them. It's pushing through the top and bottom. That keep at the bot lane is definitely falling, and I think that could be game. There's another 8 seconds, 7 until we have now Fury and back, but that thing is already low. And there's, there's more and more pressure coming in. It looks like Kurzo might win this. Kurzo is going to win this. They're going now for Kragoral, and this is game. The blue team takes the victory in game number one against Rising Gaming here on Alterac Pass. Game number two, ladies. Kurzo in the lead after that little turnaround they just experienced in Alderac Pass. Going up against Rising Gaming now on Infernal Shrines and Legion Aminelli on uh, Li Ming. Uh, we have Riku actually this time on my F, so uh, switching from uh, Hanzo into my F here. And at the same time, we're now having a Pwoki on Ana, Nasby on Johanna again, and Patsku on Blaze. Bit of a different setup, more melee heavy than what we've seen before, but the interesting part comes really on the side of Rising Gaming, because, damn, they go a bit old school here. <laughs> First of all, we have Kragoral on Carrigan with Dagba on Uther, so Divine Shielded Carrigan. We have also Kazdarad on ETC, so it could be the Holy Cow here with the Mosh Pit and Divine Shield. Kalyon on Fia and a Blank on Leoric. Ah, the Kerrigan setup. So this could be a real fun one from their perspective. Again, the Holy Cow is possible and then Kerrigan is always, of course, a big problem if you get a good combo off. And this is a map where you want to have to have that Kerrigan momentum. And so obviously a lot of CC for them. We're not only talking about that Kerrigan setup, but just having her in play is already great. And then on top of that, you have someone like ETC who can always prepare the combo or capitalize on it with the power slide and then even the mosh pit later. So that would be nice. <laughs> Surfing away from the orb as it uh, rolls through. So yeah. Let's have a quick look of how exactly this is gonna work out for the blue team because the last time they actually struggled a bit in the early game and then completely turned it around in the later stages. Is that Carrigan aggression really gonna be the the way to come back into this? We're gonna find out now. But I like it. The pom pom's ready. <laughs> Carrigan ready to cheer the team on and make the plays here. But yeah, you always have to be a little bit careful. Kerrigan is one of those momentum heroes that if she gets it, then uh, they are in a good spot. 
but obviously there's also a lot of tools against her. I mean, we're talking, for example, uh, about that sleep dot on Ana, the jet propulsion from Blaze, the bunker play by itself. There's a lot of tools that they have here. Tether already coming in as they're trying to make the play here, but then again, the power slide and the kill against Li Ming. No more damage from her. Nice setup, and that's exactly where you see all that damage coming in. Rico, on the other hand, with good works here on the AoE as well. Now they're looking for a counter kill, but they can't get it. That's the first blood right there, and the setup against Riku. Vault of the Wardens jumping out, gets the tether in a deep tether against Carrigan, and Kragoral actually survives, and so does Ophir. That was actually nicely done by Riku. He was about to fall, still went in, got the tether, jumped out, and got them back into the tower range, and that nearly led to a kill. So, very aggressive and risky play, but it was about to pay off. Carrigan lower than 100 HP, which is a bit of a problem. By the way, Triumphorate has been chosen here. It's a little bit weird to see Li Ming on this map in the first place. It's not really a hero that you see all that much on Inferno Shrines, because the value that you get on the shrine itself is limited. Then again, it's not that the hero is necessarily useless or anything, that's definitely not the case. But having Triumphrate here is still a little bit weird to me. I really want to see what happens around level 7, if we at least get Calamity. Uh, or if that's also something that she deviates away from. That said, we're currently also looking at the lineup where the first shrine is uh, being attacked. We also have by now Crowd Surfer, by the way. So it can be quite nice if you're trying to escape around this area here. But heavy aggression already here in the middle as we're having everybody with a lot of AoE, of course, that they're trying to put to good use here. So uh, let's see who's going to take that. For the time being, we're actually having, uh, besides other things, now the Neil Peasants after the Consume Vitality for Leo. The two solo laners have not joined the fight yet and are still sitting topside dealing with the camps here. Especially Blaze has to stick around a little bit longer. Massive, massive stun combo already against Li Ming. And there's the Crowd Surfer value right there over the debris, over the wall. And the kill against Li Ming. Good setup. And oh, that could be a kill. And it's not but the Vault of the Wardens. <laughs> Wow, Riku is really, really towing the line here and has been for the entire duration of this game. It's two kills against zero though, and that level 7 advantage is giving them a bit of a additional lead now. So, this C is really working out, and this is another problem. You don't really have a cleanse on Ana. I mean, obviously later on you get your, you get your um, 13, but the problem is really that from level 7 onwards you're struggling to help against those CC trains that are coming from the red team. And once that you get your, your cleanse, or so, uh, your so-called cleanse there, you are in maybe already too far behind. Because right now all those, all those stuns, they hit and they hit hard, as you can see here. That could be the end of Johanna. It should be the end of Johanna, honestly. I mean, Carrigan is already going in, should have the combo, and there's a kill against Jojo. The Punisher, in the meantime, is moving through the middle. The rest of the team is sitting at the top, and they're absolutely destroying it here. And I honestly don't really know what this orb build is supposed to do. I'm not a fan of this setup at all. You are already playing on Infernal Shrines, so I would say, if anything, Calamity is even more important here than anything else, because it's one of the few things that you will still be able to get value out during these fights. And it doesn't really seem to me that there's a chance for Li Ming to really stay far in the back and just shoot orbs the entire time and get cooldown reduction and value, because the entire setup that we're seeing from Rising Gaming is quite aggressive and is trying to go in deep, and this is where Calamity usually gives you at least some opportunities. There is a reason why Li Ming normally isn't really played on this map, and so far Lionel Mielli has already seen quite a bit of problems headed his way. And there's another potential kill against Rico. yep, there we have it. Because he has to get a little bit closer, and every single time he does, he gets attacked by all that aggression here, so it is really, really weird. And yeah. Carrigan is doing what she does best. She's trying to gain the momentum for the team, coming in for the kill, setting them up. I talked already at the beginning of the match about how ETC can capitalize on any stun or prepare the combo, and then you have Uther following up on that too. Uh, yeah, let's take a look at the damage output. Yeah, Li Ming is sitting on 9,000 damage. Not really a whole lot for her. Then again, you look over to uh, the opponent's team, and they don't have too much of a damage output there either. Big difference is, 
despite the fact they are still having four kills, so <laughs> against zero. Level 10 abilities are in now as well. And we get, amongst other things now, also a Fierce ult, which could capitalize with the Crushing Jaws now on any of these stun setups, especially if ETC goes into the stage, uh, into uh, the mosh pit. Honestly, I don't even know why he holds that back. It would be insanely stupid not to go into the mosh pit here. With Uther having the Divine Shield, I mean, seriously, are you even considering taking anything else? There's no global on the other side. So holding that back and also not picking in Tomb right away, that needs to be a pick as well. Especially with the Buried Alive later on, there's just no reason to go for March of the Black King in this setup right now. Well, I guess you can make the argument if there's a full CC trade on anybody and maybe the mosh pit, then you're going to get value out of March. But let's face it, very life is just too good and the entomb setup for anybody else here is just too powerful. So I would be a little bit upset if you would go into March over entomb. Then again, we're having camps now taken. It's, uh, as I said before, four kills against zero. At the top lane, we're having Jojo starting to push the lanes out again. And he actually went March. Oh my god, I'm triggered. He actually went into March here. Uh, I guess he really thinks that they're getting more AoE on the shrine itself and are able to get that Punisher. But the entire setup is to kill people. Solo Mosh Pit, totally worth it. Not quite sure if he really needed the Jaws there as well. Riku. <laughs> Riku actually gets out. <laughs> okay, that is, yeah, let's call it unfortunate here. <laughs> Not properly set up and therefore they actually use two big cooldowns and they get nothing in return. So they have the setup here, it's currently 18 uh, stacks already, they have a lot, there's the bunker on the ground already, having ETC sliding over the wall, but yep, the Omega Storm is already, or the Maelstrom has already been used there too, Divine Shield on ETC, um, 24 against 10 are ahead, but they are still in the situation where the top lane is pushing against them, Rising Gaming that is. Is it honestly going to be another one of these games where they dominate early on and then start to fall behind as the game continues? <laughs> Is that really going to be happening again? Uh, Kerrigan comes in, looks for the combo, doesn't quite find it there though, gets tethered in as well. ETC still in the middle of things, could go for the slide, gets focused actually, starts to fall quickly. And Fleming still looking for the value, but mostly hitting minions. Arcane Punisher gets taken by the red team, they lose Orphea though, in comes again the move by ETC. They try to get another kill and Riku is in trouble, but dodging the combo of Kerrigan. In comes Blank with a slow and that should be... Oh my god, my F gets away again. But that Punisher has still been taken. Yep, damage output here, 24,000 on my F side. We're having the aggression through the bot lane. In the middle it's actually still Leo pushing it out, which means there's only three heroes here at the bottom. And then you have to be careful, and if you're not careful, this happens. You lose Kerrigan right away. Still likely to at least get the fourth, but that's obviously a staggered death that you don't really want to have happen. But Leo is getting the experience for them right now, so that helps. Leo is also the one that has the most damage by now for them. So that really works. Level 13 talent now on both sides, which means that we're... Oh my god, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, are we sure this isn't Division 7? I mean, I know this is Division 1, I know that, but that Li Ming build is questionable at best. <laughs> Glass cannon <laughs> against that setup with all those stuns, like I'm not 100% certain what I think. Well, I'm actually, I'm really certain what I think about that. So, yeah, that's a little bit weird. Now again, we're looking at Master level, Master the Grandmaster level in Division 1 is being considered. So that is... I mean, this is a bit special, to be honest. Alright, alright, let's see how that works out. Can they keep Liming alive? That's the question. For now, they have to worry a bit more about Mayev and about Johanna, since both of them have already fallen low, and we don't have Blaze here. Yeah, the camp has also no, has been taken, so there's a lot of blue camps uh, that are currently on the map. And they have a lead, actually, in experience. Which is interesting, considering that they haven't gotten any kills in the early stages of the game. Now, besides that, we're now having also the face smell, so the additional slow that we come into here. Up to the top, Leo still pushing it out. Quite easy. Uh, quite... I have no idea what that word was, what I was trying to say with that, but that word doesn't exist. 
I think there was a mix between either and easily or something like that. I don't know why I would use either one of those in that context, but yeah, it was an interesting word generation. So, uh, yeah. Oh, you always learn new things here. You learn new words that you didn't know existed before. I don't quite know what it means. Maybe we can have a bit of a poll on what's, li what's likely, but either way. So for the time being, we're having, in this case, now again, Leo doing his thing topside. The problem is that he is <laughs> quite easily attacked by the rest of the team, and he's actually going to be safe. Oh, 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 baby! A four-man Moshpit. Three heroes down and Anna on the run. We all know how that usually ends. Oh, and that is going to be four heroes down. <laughs> what a mosh. Absolutely fantastic setup here. They were trying to go for Leo, lured into the choke point. You can't even blame them in this case. But yeah, then they get absolutely annihilated. That Mosh actually hit everyone. For a moment, I really thought that Li Ming wasn't caught by it, and I was waiting for the wave of force to interrupt the Mosh. But she was just, just on the line. And now they have level 16, but that is one of those moments where you get just absolutely wrecked. Leaving at this point, three deaths, 26,000 damage. Same as Leo, by the way. And it's actually interesting. Like, there is not a really a lot of poke damage on the side of Rising. I mean, they're not really poking a lot. Usually when they get their kills, they go... Yeah, exactly. Because someone is in here. You just killed four of them and they just respawned. But somehow they made their way over here and are trapping you right now. Now, I'm a big fan of checking bushes and making sure that there's no trap against you. But please, dude. Like, they haven't teleported on the other side of the map yet. There's no Zagara Nidus network here that all of a sudden everybody can use or something. So, <laughs> I guess better safe than sorry. We are working about good habits. But, yeah. Uh, in general, I applaud. I applaud checking bushes there. So, yeah. In this case, it wasn't quite needed. Combo hits place. They're going for the shrine here. 16 versus 16. And, actually, in this case, getting the mirror ball. Cage is down, and that might be a kill. And it is a kill. Leo is dead and so is Uther. It's a double kill. Uther not even using the Divine Shield here. They're trying to get the Carrigan value. Riku falls. That's my F at least down. Leo obviously is going to respawn soon. Carrigan is still looking to see if she can maybe jump in and get another combo. Anything that she sets up for ETC, who still has the Mosh Pit available, could lead to another kill. Since we're obviously also having uh, Ophir now. That's a problem though. Yep. Yeah. There's ETC trying to go for the slide and the kill against Sophia as Li Ming is getting some value out of the build here. Also getting the damage in against ETC can still fall back. Has also the fountain cooldown up, but it feels like they're going to give this one up. Nobody's really rotating in. Leo has already started to move now too. Is currently moving through the top lane trying to see if he can maybe proxy another wave as it seems. And we're having at the same time now everyone else moving through the map trying to get a bit more structural damage. Doing exactly that, yep. Going for the fort. There's the proxy on the wave, as already expected. Leo ghosting away here. Mr. Swiffer cleaning house. We're cleaning the map. And at the bottom of the map, Carrigan is going for another camp. She already took one. She's taking another one now. Top lane, the Mortar Punisher has been claimed. This is one of those games that really creates a couple of flashbacks if you're playing on Rising Gaming side, because you're just looking at this and you're thinking the entire time, what if it happens again? What if they beat us again now after we led with such a big lead? So Li Ming with 39,000 damage. Again, that glass cannon is at least giving her a bit of extra damage as long as she doesn't get jumped. I honestly feel that after glass cannon, Rising Gaming could be a bit more aggressive around Li Ming. They've been not really focused on her a lot here. And Li Ming uh, has already fallen three times in this game, but a quick focus and a good stun follow-up from ETC or anybody else, and she is pretty much toast in the other too. As the bait on the Punisher, and this is obviously an easy defense, since let's face it, there was a lot that the blue team had to deal with, with all the camps that were pushing through the lane and the catapults too. Bot lane defended by Patsku, and in the middle they even saved the fort here. Problem is that with the aggression in the middle against the red team's fort, we have the four heroes maybe being a little bit low, a bit far out. There's still a mosh pit up, keep that in mind. ETC is looking for it. They're starting to make the plays for it. Uh, if you only had a tomb right now, Leoreg, right? It would be great. It would be fantastic here. There's the cage, and they're trying to make the play. Stuns are in, and that should be a kill against Joe. No way. Maspe actually survives. And you know, doesn't. Blank goes in, gets the kill, and Swiffer's out of it. Gets the march of the Black King. 
which is basically with the genital aortic skin the advanced scrubbing technique that he uses to get even the dirtiest places uh, super clean yeah if you have one of those stains on the ground you know one of the stains that you just can't remove that's when the march of the black king comes in with the genital aortic skin and then afterwards you can really eat from that spot perfectly so yeah top lane that's currently where we have uh, leo uh, no, apparently they're trying to take the camp away here. I was thinking that he actually goes for the wave itself and tries to get 20 for them because that is quite a bit of experience. But at the same time now, we're having uh, them a lot closer than their opponent here. Okay, so with that, we have also the painful spikes right now. Definitely a little bit of... <laughs> that's a bit of a trap, yeah. But yeah, there's definitely a little bit of uh, setup where you can argue, okay, is that really the builds that you would have expected here? Yeah? Most of them would have said no. There's also by now at least redemption. We're also seeing the psionic shift here. Leo goes into the hardened bones. All right. Fair enough. Yeah, definitely a bit of uh, experimental setup that he has there. Yeah? It's going to survive for slightly longer. The engulfing oblivion. ETC. I mean, for ETC, you always have a couple of options of what you really want to go for with this. But, yeah, let's let's see if he can get another mosh pit through here. That's one of those choices you can make in the middle of a fight. 20 talents that allows you to uh, catch which the camp pretty easily without anybody dealing with it. I mean, it would have been suicide for Kurza to really go for this and try to fight back here. But that said, the next objective, spawning in the mid lane. Here come the level 20 talents for their opponent. Indestructible, the fortified bunker has been claimed now. Two Tal Rushas, four Li Bing, gonna cycle through that. The uh, Huntress Shadow Orb again, and the Armored Stand. So, pretty, pretty standard stuff. But let's see who's going to take the lead with this. Camp is taken over to the top. And that is already a bit of a problem because Leo is even pushing out another lane. That's two catapults already, and the camp. Someone has to deal with it, and it seems like Mayev is already getting in position for that. Which will lead to an early start here for the red team, unless they want to really jump on Mayev. And it feels they want to do that. They're all sitting around, they're all saying like, okay, whoever gets this, even a mosh pit would be worth it here. And yep, they get the mosh pit, and they are going to get the kill. That's the kill right there, and now 5 versus 4, fantastic setup for them. Defense is already in, but that was absolutely worth it. Getting the mosh pit through here was crucial. She would have escaped otherwise, and that's the kill. Didn't play it, uh, play, didn't play it slow enough. They're trying to rush it. Want to make sure that everybody's ready for the objective, and now they have one hero down. There's the anchor play from ETC, making sure nobody moves in without their knowledge. Down at the bottom, likely a fort going to fall, but obviously 18, 19 minutes in, we are thinking about making the play for the game here. And that's what they're currently looking at. Once more, we have them poking in slowly, but with 23 minion stacks already taken, there's no doubt who's going to win this particular Punisher. They're going to get the damage in here. This time they got that kill against Mayev that they missed out on earlier when they were trying to make a similar play. But right now, yeah, now Fia, 45,000 damage, are starting to move through the middle, and obviously the goal is now to at least get the keep. Ideally, you try to go for the game, but yeah, that's the uh, that's the moment right there when you're trying to get the mass value. Bot lane, as we said before, likely to fall here on the fort, but again, if you can trade that for a keep, then you're absolutely golden. And if they get a kill or two here, then they can even go for a game, and that's exactly what they're going to try and do. ETC, by the way, the only one who hasn't fallen yet in this game, so he hasn't been taken down yet. Yep, there comes the play, as they're starting to go for the keep itself, and obviously looking for a couple of heroes too. There comes the first attack with a combo attempt. Uh, unfortunately, the ult missing here from Ophia. Damage output with the Divine Shield, and they're trying to go for Li Ming. Glass Cannon again, keep it in mind. Definitely hurts. Riku is also a little bit low. Needs to be cautious and jumped into the fortified bunker. The keep is low. And here comes the combo against Jojo. The indestructible gets propped. But everybody is low. And Dark Bar goes down. Redemption should keep him in play for now. Moving ETC still sliding around. Uther obviously capitalizing on the trade right now. Dropping the heals here. And he's going to be back in just a second. Easy peasy. Move back. They get the keep and move out of harm's way. 11 kills against 6. Surprisingly, not as far as had as you would expect here from Rising Gaming, but they had a tough time in the late game in game number one. And right now, Kurzo is always threatening to get those combos off and just simply turn that game around. So you need to be cautious with that. But taking the keep was already an important step. Bot lane, 
That's where the next Punisher is going to spawn, the next objective. But it's all gonna come down to that one big fight there, I would assume. Unless, of course, they can set something up where they bait someone out on the map like they did with Mayev earlier. If they can move, do that, that would be great for them. With this case, we're having also now the camps being focused on heavily. Any additional pressure you can set up on the map is great because you force your opponent to invest some time to deal with those situations. I would love for them to take the walls down too, just to limit vision a little bit more. In a lot of these cases, you don't really need to show all of your heroes. You can keep a few of them back, set them aside here, just to make sure that your opponent always has to guess where are you, where are you positioned, is there a trap somewhere. So if you can limit vision in the late game, that's usually one of the big moves you want to go for. With that, on the other hand, for just a second, it really looked like we might see ETC with the slide, but obviously, as long as Iron Skin is still there, Johanna can easily move out, and if you already use the power slide to move in, you might be in quite a bit of trouble. As a camp that has to be dealt with at the top. Ah, oh, Fear's a little bit far out here. Yeah, Jet Propulsion should come through. Gets actually blocked in this case, only connecting with one. But Ophia oh, is dead regardless. Big mosh pit attempt, but this time the wave of four shuts it down. ETC is dead. Oh, a five man! A five man setup! Li Ming is down. No class cannon value this time. The death mosh and they get five, but they only get a single kill, but that's all they need. I had flashbacks already to game number one that could have maybe even been the end if they get more. Rico is low, Carrigan still starting to attack and get some shields together, but the top lane is assailed and this one is going to fall. Five man death mosh. Holy shit. That was something. But yeah, getting the kill against Li Ming definitely helped to ensure that they have a fighting chance here, despite the fact that they lost ETC and off here. Honestly, picture that fight for just a moment without that ult, without that five man. If they don't get that counter kill and can't save the rest of the team, they might have lost another hero, maybe even two. They could have moved, or the blue team could have moved top side and gone for core here. The keep was already nearly down. By the time they arrived, that keep wouldn't have existed and they could have simply gone for core here. So that was actually a super important moment. Also, shields have actually fallen on the core side here. No damage taken, but they have to deal with the catapult here. We're talking 23 minutes into the game. That's Winion time. That's where the Winions take it. This is the reason why they took the catapult down here, because the minions alone won't do anything. But now they have to fight. Li Ming is back and she's coming in. And this is going to be the big battle. The potentially final fight. And look at the stacks. 30 stacks for them already. Blaze, on the other hand, doesn't have the fortified bunker. Is down. I don't know if the hit points to survive there any longer. But, yep, here comes again. Uh, Blank with a move into the back line. Trying to slow them down here. Kastara doesn't have the ult up yet. 10 more seconds until the mosh pit is available. And he starts to slide in. They might get the kill. And they do get the kill. Glass cannon mingles down. And so does Anna. Anna is dead, everybody low, Rico trying to get the kills and gets it against CGC, but the death mosh, and this time they are all going down, everybody's gonna fall here, this is gonna be a five man team wipe right here, as everybody gets obliterated on the side of Kurzo, the core is already wide open as we're seeing the red team start to move through the middle, Rising Gaming is aiming straight for the victory in game number two, we're gonna see a third map between the two teams here in division one as rising gaming claims infernal shrine and takes down their opponent big big fight there towards the end and rising gaming successful Carrigan worked out for them and etc in particular did as well as we are heading into game number three the, the last and deciding map in this best of three series here at heroes launch gg Game number three, the final one, and if you thought that the last team composition was already a bit wild, well, think again, because game three is coming. We on Volskaya Foundry, the final map of the series, and on the left side, Elijah Namieli on Junkrat, Rico on Hanzo, Puoki again on Hanzo, must be on Johanna, third time in a row, and Patsku on Leoric. Carrigan, on the other hand, gets played again by Kragoral for Rising Gaming as they were successful on the last mat. And <laughs> look at what we're having here. Oh, fresh meat. 
the butcher is in play. Kazdarat on uh, ETC, Kelly on Jaina, and Darkba on Malfurion. So they go again into that ETC mage setup that they already had previously. And yeah, I'm a big fan of this one. We are in Division 1. Again, I have to point this out because the comps are a bit wild. Now, when you're looking at this, this is m not necessarily typical for Division 1 compositions, by the way. So when I select some of these matches... Um, oh, ho, 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 the slide and the kill! Anduin is down. Alrighty. Something that you can cry about. Um, yeah, obviously, with some of the games... Ooh, I like that skin, by the way. I honestly have never really seen that skin in action, because, let's face it, how many butchers do you see? That is sexy as hell. Hanzo died in the meantime, but honestly, I couldn't care less because that skin is quite something. I might have to play Butcher again. It's also a little bit worrisome, honestly, if you have someone in your team that owns a Butcher skin, like one of the newer Butcher skins. <laughs> like, if you have someone in your team that owns a skin like this and picks Butcher, then you're already looking at this and like, uh, I don't know how much I like this. Um, I mean, it, again, it gives you maybe a bit of confidence in his abilities, but if you have someone that says he mains Butcher, that's usually not a good start into any game. Either way, uh, I wanted to talk real quickly about how the compositions here are not necessarily typical for Division 1 games. Now, keep in mind, when we're actually going into a match where we cast from replays, because I just think it would be cool matches, that's true for a lot of the Division 7 games, I usually take a peek at some of the compositions. Now there's spoiler functions so that I don't know how the games end, I don't know how many matches there are, but I usually look at game one, game two, at least and uh, look at comps and see, okay, do we have some fun heroes here? And how is this looking like? And so obviously this was something where the Kerrigan and in this case the Butcher have already given me a little bit of a, hey, I might wanna cast this one. So people obviously sometimes draw the conclusion then immediately that this is reflective of every game that happens within Division 1 or any division that we show, and that's not quite the case. So I have to put that in as a little caveat just so that people understand what we're looking at here. What we're looking at right now is the death of Malfurion as Greenbeard gets taken apart here. Gets a little bit singed by Leo, who gets the uh, Swiffer to the face here. Oh, I shall Swiffer and Krakura jumping in on Kerrigan. Had a bit of a suicide um, wish, apparently. It went down. Blank, obviously, in the meantime, is trying to get the stacks together for uh, the Butcher. As we all know, this is a late game hero. I mean, obviously, you want to complete your baseline first of all, so that you are in a position where you can finally start uh, being a bit more aggressive without being afraid that you are getting locked down in your progress or lose your progress. So it's more of a late game hero and therefore a passive early game is oftentimes what you can expect from a butcher setup. I don't really expect Blank to go too hard, but let's see how this is gonna panning on or gonna be panning out for them. It is the first objective and despite the changes that we've seen to the map, we are currently having a setup in uh, in which Corso can definitely gain some momentum by winning the protector and capitalizing on the weaker early game of the butcher. That being said, there is again a lot of CC that we are seeing for Ryzen Gaming. I mean, obviously we have the power slide from ETC, we have Malfurion with the lockdowns through the roots, you have Jaina slows, Carrigan's combo, and then the Butcher on top of that. So this is definitely a game where if you don't play your cards right, you're gonna be in a world of pain there. This time at least on the cleanse front, things are looking a little bit different. Leo gets attacked here pretty quickly. Blank is starting to move in for it and starts to get some damage in. That's already great for them and forces him to retreat and uh, uh, hop at the fountain. <laughs> we have the big ass as level 7 here. So a bit more lockdown by Junkrat in this game. Apparently designed to keep the Butcher at bay. An apple a day keeps the Butcher away. Well, that's nah, not quite that bad. But yeah, a steel trap a day maybe does the trick. That's at least the, the hope here for them. Blade momentum at this point. And, well, they're starting to take the point here. I'm actually a little bit surprised. I mean, of course, it is, again, with all the CC, it is tricky. It is very, very tricky. You need to be careful that you're not getting uh, locked down completely. And also, Iron Skin really helps, obviously, to mitigate some of that. The Butcher is sitting at 75 stacks right now, and if they get kills, that would be even worse. Yeah, there's already the beacon on the ground that they took earlier. Now we're seeing the turrets also dropped in the attack attempt again with both of the turrets being in play. 
But the blue team is starting to move in, and time is currently working in favor of Rising Gaming. As long as the Butcher stacks, maybe even gets a kill here, then a decent spot. That 99% right now, so they can give this up for a little bit more. They can just try and see if they can maybe also grab another item, but they are already retaken, so they took them a little bit late in this. Nice setup, and that could be a kill. That could be a kill, it should be a kill, and it isn't a kill. Instead, it's a kill against Carrigan, who went too deep and trying to go for the drop against Leo, who rides on the, the, mount, uh, the money pig majestically into the fight and out of it. That's the first protector, more or less secured through that Carrigan drop in favor of Corzo. Nicely done. Currently down to the bottom of the map, the Butcher is doing his thing against Patsku, is obviously attempting to get also another kill himself, so that he can get 20 additional meat stacks. So far we don't really see that happening, he's sitting at 82, but with them losing out on the Protector, he's still finding himself on that solo lane. That didn't really do a whole lot. <laughs> so whoever whoever controls that right now needs, needs a pair of glasses if you ask me. Your prescription is wrong, my friend. You need to visit a doctor because that was slightly off the mark here. I mean, either way, we're currently having level 10 abilities for them that would give them a chance to play more aggressive. Light bomb once more taken. And we have the blessed shield. We have also the arrow. Butcher is going for the safe rotations here, and so he should since obviously he needs to maintain those stacks. We're having 89, and they're rotating down. Now again, normally the rotation is really a one towards the top where you're prepping for objective number two. I've seen the rotation to the bottom now once, and I still don't know 100%. I've seen it once in Division S. Now again, the standard rotation on this map is that you rotate with the objective every single time towards the next uh, objective, the next spawn, and that would be the top, because you're trying to prepare the lane for that. I've seen one Division S game now, where they actually deviated away from it and rotated with the first objective down to the bottom of the map and took down the fountain there. Now you can make the argument that the third objective is more important than you prepare for that, but generally speaking, that was also a game where it was a top team against a bottom team, speaking from a standings perspective. So I really, really think that Kurzo should have moved topside. And I'm honestly a bit surprised. We have seen already a few mistimings around the camps that have been taken. Normally that happens around the one minute mark in the game, and that wasn't the case uh, when the game started. And we have now also seen the rotation towards the bottom instead of the top. And I would have expected a little bit more on this map from uh, Division 1 teams, to be absolutely honest. That's something that even Division 7 these days is starting to do more and more. The ring on the other hand connects, but Kerrigan is down again and underlying once more that she is a momentum hero. In this case, she just doesn't get that momentum. And again, that might be another kill, and indeed it is. Blank gets the stacks, and now with additional 40, thanks to the double kill against Anduin and Johanna, he's sitting at 140 stacks nearly. And they're trying to get another one. There's the mosh pit, and there's another drop against Junkrat. That's another 20 taken, and with that, we have 163 stacks on the Butcher. Meat everywhere. And this is actually starting to become a little bit of a problem for Kurzo, since the stacked Butcher is a happy butcher. And you don't want to have a butcher in a happy place. That's not really a game that you're going to enjoy. Unless, of course, he's on your team. But looking at the damage output, again, on, this, on the butcher... I'm actually surprised. 14,000 damage for the butcher? That isn't too bad. Normally, butcher players are quite low in damage output. Most of their damage is single target and comes online later on in the game. But here we have only 14,000 and another kill. Oh my god, what an ult! Blank with a fantastic ult, and the follow-up is there immediately. And that's him, now nearly completely stacked. He's stacked 200, Butcher is stacked 8 minutes, 9 minutes in. And obviously he's gonna continue that stacking process now with kills throughout the game, but now he can be more aggressive. Went into the Brutal Strike now as well, after previously focusing on his E with the Unrelenting Pursuit, and the Meat Shield. That's gonna be a problem. Oh, that was a great kill. Six kills against five now. And we have, again, Rising in the lead in the early game. Now, we've seen this a few times, but it was the middle of the game where it was a bit different. Interesting. Patsko actually not great walking away. Might have been on cooldown here. 
Which I start again, he's starting to hurt. He is starting to hurt. Obviously, you want to have more than only 200, but that alone is already going to give you a big punch. I mean, as you see here, you have the additional, the attack speed and everything else. Uh, but yeah, if you can stack that even more through team fights, it would be fantastic. But this is usually a map that really lends itself to those team fights. Here comes the attack with the Entomb. This time against Jaina, and that should be an easy kill, but there's already the heals in play, and that's a lot actually. Jaina is still alive. Carry again, then again, she dies. This time without the Divine Shield. No Uther on there, and, and you can tell that this is starting to become a problem. ETC is also about to get dropped, but able to move out just in the nick of time before the final hits come in. Jaina is going to have her ice block soon, but at this moment in time, she is still a bit vulnerable. And they pulled all the stops here to make sure that she survives, but Kerrigan, whenever she engages here and is left alone, when the Butcher doesn't move in together with her, when ETC isn't available, she just falls. And you can tell that already from her death count. Seeing at five deaths, very, very different game for Jaina compared to what we've seen previously on Inferno Shrines. Now the lead on the objective goes to the blue team. Kurzo takes it, but obviously this isn't over yet. Leo, by the way, the only one on the blue team that hasn't fallen yet. <laughs> no trade value, at least not in this game. And well, now the time to see if they can maybe coordinate a five-man attack with that front line, really delivering and setting something up for Jaina. Ten seconds until we have the ring back on... And once that ring is in, I mean, seriously, you have Lamb to the Slaughter and you have the Mosh Pit. They have a lot of good arguments on how they can play this out if they set something up, and that's exactly what they need to do right now. And they are waiting and they have everything. Well, there's the arrow hitting only one in the back line. Jaina is affected, but that's the only one. They're starting to move in. Hanzo nearly is solo killed, and there comes the ring, but it doesn't really do anything for them here. The rip tire comes through, gets burned down though, and Carrigan again too far out. Carrigan again in trouble, but here comes ETC. They're trying to save her this time, and this is looking much better. Leo goes down. That's even more meat now for the Butcher, who's sitting at 220 stacks. But it still highlights the problem a little bit. They need to coordinate this attack a bit better. Kragural needs to make sure that others are with him when he makes those engages, especially when Leo hasn't used his Entomb yet and can still lock them down here. The Enraged on level 16, and that level 16 is a big lead now. Combo misses from Carrigan. again. Again, they're low. Again, they're in trouble. The Mosh Pit comes in, and there's no interrupt. Butcher comes in, tries to go for Anduin, and the Crybaby is about to get dropped here. Anduin goes down. Hansa is also for another double kill. They're looking for the triple. They're looking even for more. Yeah, they want the stacks, and they're getting the stacks. 240 for the Butcher as he charges in again, gets the 250. Needs to get out, though and is able to make that happen as well. Nicely played here. They made the perfect engage, 99% already on the progress bar. Junker in the meantime is pushing the bot lane and at least preparing that. In the middle of Ford is about to be lost as well, so it's not like there's no damage against Rising Gaming, but again, they are getting mass value, and especially the Butcher with 250 stacks is now obviously starting to get solid damage numbers onto the board too. He's not the top damage in the game just yet, but Butchers rarely are. 34,000 on the other hand highlights once again that Blank definitely knows what he's doing and I mean he better if you rock a butcher skin and you own that then you better know what you're doing with the hero so at this point he hasn't died yet and he delivers the pain and the ult and that's fucking cheating <laughs> that's just cheating <laughs> that was a fantastic ult by him and then Anduin comes out and he's like boop <laughs> that's like, I don't know what I think about this. I, I honestly don't like that. He just goes in, he's like, no. Yeah, uh, feels a little bit bad. I mean, there's a lot of ults that can be negated by a quick cleanse or other abilities, and that's a perfect example. Uh, so, yeah, gets that out. There's the arrow coming in. And, well, this time it doesn't connect with anything. Earlier, at least, it hit Jaina in the back line. But now they're rotating into the middle. I don't really like, again, that they poked at the keep here. I feel like there was no need to do that. So we're coming back to map basics, and I'm really shocked that the Division 1 teams here seem to lack quite a few of those. If you have a setup in which you know you can't go for the keep because you don't have a massive talent advantage over your opponent, the rotation is usually to either go straight down to the back 
uh, sorry, the bot lane uh, because you want to prepare for the third objective, or you take the fort at the top lane first and then rotate down towards the bottom. Sometimes, depending on how much HP your Punisher still, so your Protector still has, you can go into the middle and say you take the fort too. But the thought process is always the same: prepare for the next objective if there is still a fort with a fountain on the lane for your opponent. And if you have a massive lead and got a couple of kills, maybe you have a talent advantage, then think about going keep instead. But this was weird. Taking the fort at the top lane, not a problem, but then moving towards the keep wall, that's definitely an issue. And not even getting the fort in the middle, that's not really worth a whole lot. For the entire trouble that they went through to get the protector, they got a single fort and a wall. And they lost the fort in the middle and the one at the bottom in the process because it got pushed by the maps. So I'm obviously a little bit shocked that a Division 1 team seems to have trouble to really get those basic things coordinated here. Outside of that, we're seeing much, much better coordination right now from them. But map mechanics is definitely something that I would like to see a bit improved when it comes to uh, at least this map, not the others. And maybe it's not the map that they usually play, but right now, let's see how this turns out. Butcher is already lying in wait here, trying to s look for an opportunity. Now Hanzo, there's the slide, there's the mosh pit, and again the safe as Anduin goes in. But the arrow, the entomb! Kerrigan, on the other hand, gets value, and this time she stays alive. The ring connects with one. Once we have ETC down, though, a lot of those stuns are out of the question. In comes the old, and that's an opportunity again for another kill. But Nasby is able to move away. In the meantime, we have Malfurion fall in the back up to the top. Looks like Jaina might get a kill. Not quite that strong, but the kill and the meat. But the end of the Butcher probably too. 260 stacks for him now, but it's still a 3 for 1 trade. Kerrigan is still running and they can go for the items now. They have to send someone back though, because the camp is still doing work. But now with 12 kills against 9, all of a sudden Kurzo is starting to gain again a slight momentum. And that is something that... Yeah, Honestly, it has been new through this entire bloody series. Kurzo struggles in the early game and then in the late game they win a few fights and they are able to slowly and steadily get value there. It was honestly, I mean it was a bit heartbreaking from Rising's perspective to just not see them get kills. There were so many heroes that barely escaped. Then again, you can obviously say the coordination wasn't there and therefore a bit problematic. There was a nice attempt at the start to go for Hanzo but then Anduin with a big boy safe again and Jaina missing quite a bit of her damage in this instant too, just because of that. But now we have at the bot lane the uh, yeah, objective spawning. And as I said before, look at the situation right now. The fountain is down, and because they failed to attack the bot lane earlier, there's now still a total fort set up with two turrets and a fountain. So a massive advantage for Kurzo for objective number three. So definitely a problem here. But now we have 20. They're trying to go for the invade here, or at least threaten it. But of course, Storm Talons are now ready for both. And again, a good setup through the blue team's uh, side on the top lane. Getting that camp, highly important, good timing for them. Is going to threaten the fort here while the fight focuses on the bottom of the map. EDC is going to have the mosh pit up in time. We have double Bolt of the Storm already, or Bolt of the Storm variations, with Carrigan and Jaina. No cold snap this time, so not looking for the cooldown reduction here. Bullseye, they're trying to make the play for Jana again. Iron skin used early, needs to be careful now. In the meantime, we're having the Glyph of Faith again. And we're also having the Buried Alive, the big game changer, the big boy talent on Leo that can decide an entire game. ETC probably gonna go into the death mosh again, at least it worked out last time. But let's see if they can uh, win this fight. Who's gonna take it here? Top lane, as I said, under pressure. That fort is going to fall eventually. Right now, there's the Entomb against Malfurion. Great setup. Ring comes out. They're trying to make the play, and they get the kill against Malfurion. Can the counter kill happen, though? That's the big question right now. Ult is already being used from blank, but it doesn't connect with anybody. And now we have also the kill against Jaina herself. Damage dealer is already out. A move by blank towards the left side. Nice move, actually. Good hiding spot here for him and able to just move away. So that at least worked for them. But obviously it looks like they're going to lose the objective now. It's already getting channeled by their opponent. Has the rod sitting at the side here. Butcher can come in, Kerrigan can come in. But here comes now Anduin and also Junkrat. So that's a little bit too much trouble to ask for. They're starting to make the play here. There's the slide and the immediate boop out. They kill nearly against the Butcher and he goes down. But at least they get Hanzo with this as well. Once again, Kazerat moving away. Didn't have the mosh pit ready as all of this happened. Unfortunate also for the Butcher that he didn't even get the stacks for that last kill. 
but obviously they bought themselves a little bit more time and honestly even with the butcher taken out here they might be able to contest this again and go straight in for it 53,000 damage by the way in the butcher top damage on his team 78k for Hanzo drunk but obviously nothing to sneeze on either with 78,000 but now in a four versus four they can make a play they can actually start to go for this and try and delay it long enough for Hanzo to come back and also the Butcher to come back into this. Hanzo didn't go into the play of the game, so he will have to travel through that the normal way. And there's the setup. They're starting to get a bit of the action going. Butcher back in 14. Ults are already on both sides, by the way. But without the Butcher, can they actually really go for that? They're trying. They're trying to go for Leo. And that's a lot of damage. Kerrigan, on the other hand, buried alive. Ring of Frost comes in. And the Butcher is surviving through all of it as Kerrigan goes down again. The buried alive just a bit too strong. Butcher on the move up to the top. Hanzo is dealing with the camp. And down here, the mosh pit. And it's a big one, but he's falling anyways. ETC is down. The death mosh with a bit of value. Hanzo's arrow doesn't hit anything. And now they are just thinking, do we retreat? Do we take this? And they decide to go for the defense instead and just let the protector fall into the hands of their opponent. Yeah, a little bit of a dicey setup right now. That is a 20-minute protector that we're talking about at this point. And they're starting to go in. Let's look at the damage outputs again. At this point, six deaths on Carrigan. Yeah, again, Carrigan had massive trouble in this game. They are dealing with her much better. There is no Uther around. There is no Divine Shield this time. This is one of the big problems that they're having with this. And now, obviously, a quick annihilation of the first keep in the game. And that could very well lead to this series being finished off by Kurzo as they are looking for the 2-1 win in this best of three. And they're already making the moves here. ETC is going to be back in another 10. It's a four versus five right now. And they're all dodging around. There's still plenty of time on the protector, but they need to burn it down. That's exactly what they're trying to do. Here comes the lamb to the slaughter already being used. They're trying to get the damage in. Blank in trouble and Blank is down. The Butcher is dead. No more meat for him. And Carrigan dies shortly after. They're trying to get another kill in, but at this point, there's no doubt anymore that this game is going to end in a few seconds. That protector is just doing way too much work at this point. They're simply moving in. Only three survivors. Obviously, they can go for another kill and they get ETC, but this looks like Jaina's going to fall too. She might get the kill against Hanzo, but no, yeah, at least that happens. Malfurion with a late Moonfire into the ground as Hanzo nearly survived with 9 HP. But as it stands, we have the victory in the series for Kurzo as they claim the 2-1 against Rising Gaming, the Butcher, without a victory in this series.